inflation transitory or not, I want to take you back to your trip to the supermarket where you were looking for chicken, no chicken to be found, and you found it's not just a Singapore phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon and prices are 20% higher. That's right. And I think, you know, we're seeing signs of pipeline inflation in many places. It happens to be in chicken wings at the weekend. But, um, you know, when you're looking around at any indicator, whether it's commodity price inflation, pipeline price pressures, many of these indicators are getting up to 20, 30-year highs. And you have to reflect on that. And I think Janet Yellen got caught out a little bit yesterday uh, with her comments. But, um, you know, there is more inflation around than we've seen for some time, and it has to be taken seriously. So how, is, how, how, how are investors pricing that in? Well, the bond market was very early, too, so break even. So the measure of inflation implied in bond pricing had um, reached pretty high levels even a few months ago. But as we've gone forward, we're seeing more investors now switching, whether it's to value investments, which typically do well when inflation is higher, or it's into straight into the commodity market and the commodity prices in some cases, have gone stratospheric in just recent trading sessions. But we think there's more to go because we think that uh, with the amount of money that's still to be spent in terms of pent-up demand around the world, plus government spending coming through in, in barrels, you know, the trillions that have been spent in the United States in particular, but also elsewhere in places like Europe, that leads to a tremendous demand and puts pressure on supplies of goods who are pushing prices up. Gary, this is it, isn't it? I mean, prices of goods going up. And of course, you've mentioned chicken wings. We've also got shipping costs uh, on the rise, too. All of these adding up to uh, the, the, the sort of uh, cost push side of things. But uh, the point is for any sustained inflation to be there, we've got to see demand pull inflation, if you will. And tell me something, are we seeing any of that? And that would, of course, necessarily bring about a more sustained inflationary environment. Yeah, I totally agree. I, you know, for it to be sustained, we're going to need to see particularly wage inflation. But there are some signs of it. You know, if you see that for those countries that have been opening up, there are shortages of labor. Companies are having to pay up in the near term in order to encourage people uh, back into work. And that, that may just uh, develop into something more broader. And I think the, the, the guide will come from governments. If governments start to give their employees more pay, uh, through the course of this year, whether it's political reasons or they see the inflation, that I think could set off increasing wages in the private sector, and then you've got a, a bigger problem in terms of inflation for central bankers. Well, in that case, and according to your research, we should be looking at gold. Why should we look at gold and not Bitcoin or cryptos uh, for the same reason? Well, I suppose you, at least you've got a lot of history to look at. I think, we, you know, I think people are just uh, adding t two things up and seeing crypto prices going up with inflation prices and then just assuming that cryptos will continue to go up. I, I do believe that gold reacts to inflation, not necessarily when it's just dribbling a little bit higher, but when we get a significant surprise to the upside. And as I go back to the previous comment, if we get more wage inflation and more sustained inflation in the system, I think gold will react as it has done over, you know, 20 or 40 years of experience, where we see gold, you know, possibly moving up to, to, to the $2,000 level within the next six months if inflation is more persistent than the economists currently expect. Uh, Gary, we've seen how commodities in general have gone gangbusters. Uh, is there still anything looking attractive to you? I would, yes, I would say that uh, for those people who've got no exposure to commodities and particularly to metals, there's still a very strong story and there's still significant upside. You know, one of the comments that we keep, keep, or keep uh, reflecting on is when you see all of the money that's been spent on green initiatives. Green initiatives have a very high percentage of copper, aluminium and many other kind of uh, more base materials. And these base materials at the moment are in short supply. So if you don't have exposure to commodities, you're missing a trick in your portfolio structure. Uh, Gary, I want to take a look at the risks in the market. We have equities with valuation 25% above their five-year average. Uh, I'm just wondering, where do they go from here? 
Yeah, I, I think the risk is, and it's a, a literally what's hit Singapore overnight, is that clearly the authorities are more concerned with what's happening in India and that it may have spread further. So if we were to get another closure of some of the economies, um, and even, you know, I see the UK are pushing ahead and everyone's going to go on holiday. You know, if this virus just spreads and surprises us again in terms of creating another wave, I think there'd be significant disappointment in the markets. You wouldn't have the same sustained improvement in demand growth, and therefore people would want to take lock in some of the profits they've made, uh, particularly over recent months with a rally in equities. Gary, at what point do you look uh, at you know, what you do uh, as a, a, in a family office, in, in essence? When do you actually switch to wealth preservation as opposed to wealth accumulation? I think you'd, you'd only do a wealth preservation if you were very, very sensitive to downside risk over a short period of time. I think you know, the last 10 to 12 years has just told us that... Uh, when markets fall, it's a buying opportunity. I mean, I don't like it. I prefer to be based on fundamentals. But when central bankers are still pumping money into the economy, interest rates anchored at very, very low levels, then I think, you know, you basically stay with it. Now, the only uh, risk with that strategy is that we go back to the bad old days when inflation was a tremendous problem rather than a modest problem, as it may be through the course of 12 months. But we're vigilant for more inflation than perhaps the market's expecting. Gary, what about your clients? What are they looking at at the moment? I mean, we've seen reflation. We've seen this sort of tussle between uh, value and growth. Are they now looking elsewhere? I mean, we can see what's going on commodities-wise. Great guns for the uh, commodity sector and the complex as a whole. Where do they go at the moment? What are they interested in? Um, they're interested in anything that's been left behind. That's why, you know, we've been commenting recently that we think Japanese equities start to look interesting after some significant underperformance. But to be honest, people are still sticking with you know, some of the growth themes. There's still a lot of money there for technology on any setback. But at the margin, I'm seeing people invest into value. So really kind of quite boring companies like food manufacturing companies that are seeing inflation for the first time or yield stocks that give you a 4% yield when you know that maybe government bond yields will remain closer to the maximum, say, 2%. So more old economy. And, and, and more of that kind of uh, inflation trade that we talked about in both commodities and some value sectors. 